Fellow tennis nerds, today I'm here with uh, a guy I got to know in uh, Paris, actually through a head event. We went there together. He's very active on Instagram. He has a, a great resource for coaching tips and other things. Uh, Dylan G, he's based in London and uh, he's always active. You always see him. He's like modeling, he's doing tennis coaching <laughs> and he's used to play as a pro. So welcome to the podcast, Dylan. Thank you very much, Jonas. And uh, yeah, no, great to speak to you online and yeah, looking forward to this, to this talk with you. So how has your day been? What, what's your summer like? You, you don't vacation. You always seem to be on a tennis court somewhere. Uh, yeah, uh, well, this is vacation for me. <laughs> I, I, love, I love being on court. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it doesn't change too much, to be honest. I mean, if I do need some time off, then I will, I will take the necessary time. But usually um, for what I do uh, in the coaching uh, work, it's uh, pretty busy. I work six days a week, about 40 to 45 hours a week roughly and then the social media all of that side is on top of every everything as well but uh yeah in due time hopefully i can take more of the social media as the front runner for what i would like to do long term so what's your plans what do you feel like you're you're most enjoying yourself like you seem to be comfortable in all areas there but what what's what where would you see yourself maybe in five years so short term i'd like to actually uh, do more things online uh, my, my biggest goal is to help the wider tennis community so if i can go to network at more events travel the world and help academies individuals and things like that would be a big goal of mine i find that social media was my biggest um, pathway into helping more people um, i mean I, I do love what i do here at the, at, at the club that i'm at but i feel like if i want to really help a wider audience um I would need to travel a bit more and then use the power of social media to to help me with that. What Sorry, club my, are you based at? So I'm based in North London, uh, David Lloyd's Finchley. It's, uh, it's a branch and we have 10 indoor courts. We have five outdoor courts, six outdoor courts actually. So it's a very big club. We have a spa gym, pretty amazing facilities, but it's not a tennis club so much. It's like a leisure center. So with the with the other activities that you can do here, it's uh, mainly for the general public. It's not really a performance place, even though I do have some performance players, um, some national players actually, but they're a bit younger, and some university players. So I think it's a nice balance. I, I get a, a feel for the different ages and abilities. What do what you think is your coaching sweet spot? Do you prefer coaching kind of like intermediate or even beginners, or do you really like to work with performance players and try to be more in that kind of competition? side of things so I like the balance actually if I'm honest I think my content and what I mainly do uh, meets the needs for the general public so like a beginner to intermediate person as opposed to a professional but uh, I've started um, reaching out to a few pros and uh, even sparring again and playing myself which is a lot of fun so actually doing that it makes me uh, it just challenges me in a different type of way so I think if I can keep that nice balance, then for sure I'd like to, to carry that on. And maybe if I were to travel globally, then I could uh, network with even more people. But uh, I, I would like to do maybe a bit more sparring and uh, hear, the, hear the stories of some futures, challenges, even ATP, WTA players. I mean, I think tennis is such a challenging sport, but it's also taught so many life skills to me. And I think I'd like to hear it from other people as well. So I think... If I can travel, and hopefully in the, in the future, then for sure I'd like to get those messages across to, to people on my social media. Do you, um, I mean, you used to play and go for pro. Uh, do you still, like, I mean, you're quite a young guy still, right? So do you, would you want to go back to competing, or is that life behind you? So good question. So I felt like, let's start with um, why, why I, I stopped. I actually uh, was studying in America. I had a Division One scholarship. Um, at a university in Alabama and I was looking to actually take my tennis more seriously instead of focusing on the studies at that present time so after the two years I, I was looking at a few other universities but the fees were very expensive so I thought oh maybe I might have to stay at that university but focus even more on my tennis while trying to play futures and and, and travel a little bit further and I actually found a sponsor at the club I'm at David Lloyd's so that kind of gave me the opportunity to say 
if I want to play professional tennis, this would uh, be like a stepping stone for me. I would probably um, never be able to afford that. So I took that decision and decided to play professional tennis and travel to Germany to play an academy and go full time where I did about just under 30 tournaments in about a year, gaining uh, 80, point, 80 points in singles and doubles, meeting some amazing people. Um, training with high-level pros as well, and just getting the experience of what it's like on the, on the Futures Tour. And uh, yeah, it was an amazing opportunity. I felt like if I could have played longer, I definitely would have. Uh, for me, the biggest thing was I, I, I couldn't see myself coaching and playing. Um, I felt like I wanted to give it my absolute all and just only play. I think it's, uh, it probably would have been a bit selfish of me to carry on playing and then rely on other sources of income or maybe not have enough to make ends meet and maybe only do 10 tournaments maybe 15 tournaments in a year i felt like i didn't want to drag it out i wanted to go full out with my tournament schedule i wanted to just focus on the professional career route actually before i came back to my studies in england i went to qatar and i was training um one of the best boys uh, actually in under 12s in in qatar he was a young syrian boy he's actually playing on the futures tour right now his name's tim and uh, he's, uh, I, think he's, I think he's got his first uh, ATP points, actually. So he's doing well, and uh, it's nice to see the progressions for him. But for me, I felt like I wanted to go down the route of coaching because I was so passionate about wanting to help other people. And when I was playing professional tennis around 2016, that's when I started posting on social media, when functional tennis was only in the thousands of their following, and now they're 600,000 plus. So... I felt like I already got a little bit more known in the, in, the, in the tennis community through social media. And that's what carried on throughout my university studies in England and then um, thereafter. I mean, throughout university in England, I did three years. I was still competing, but I was working full time as well while studying. So I was playing against ex ATP ranked players, guys that like 400, 500 and, and uh Holding my own, but not obviously uh, performing to the same level. But I, I really enjoyed that aspect. But I, I took it upon myself to, to really focus and knuckle down on my, on my coaching. Um, throughout when I was in, um, playing professional, I really loved the SNC um, aspects of tennis. And my original goal was to be a strength conditioning coach. So I did my level four strength conditioning qualifications. And I focused heavily on the on-court movement. That was a particular strong point of mine. And uh, for the likes of even Holger Runa, we were, we were following each other when he was about 13, 14, 15 years old. And, uh, and to see how well he moved at that young age, it really inspired me to want to pursue that career. But um, I think I just fell in love with the, with the on-court tennis aspects even more. So that's what I, what I wanted to pursue <laughs> even more after that. But yeah, I, I, I do like playing still, um, not competing in tournaments. I think um, I think just due to my coaching schedule, it doesn't always allow me to have that flexibility. And um, no, I'm just very passionate at just helping other people. I saw you posted something on YouTube where you were coaching like a female WTA pro, an aspiring WTA pro, for example. And you, it's quite interesting to see, you know, the kind of drills you're doing and stuff like that. And uh, is that something you would want to do more, like actually get some tour player to uh, to work with, even if it's not full time, but maybe part-time or something definitely i think that's another aspect that i want to use i want to maximize that i'm still capable to play at a, at a good level and so i can be a sparring partner i can be a backboard to um wj players even some atp players as well um anyone that's looking to want to play and um and then i can give maybe some pointers for coaching as well but i feel like if i can sustain a decent level when playing at least um for my clientele that I have and, and young kids, they will at least see that, okay, Dylan is actually still competing and playing at a good level rather than, um, I think it's also actually, when you think of playing, if you are if you haven't actually played any matches or you haven't sparred and trained, you kind of fall out of that practice rhythm and the mental aspects of being on court. I did play a match actually this year for the first time in a long time. And I was making mistakes thinking, okay, why did I choose to go down the line on that shot? And so I was thinking as a coach, but I was dissecting my own game in the moment. It was very interesting. So I have a different perspective. When you 
are in these situations with, with, with let's say you're playing a match, you will have to figure out problems and then you can help the players who are suff like encountering the same problems. So I think it's, it's important also to be not too far away from the competition when you're coaching competition players. I think that it, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, so so I, I agree with that. When it comes to like coaching um, like club level players or, or you know, people like that, what's like the most common problem you see? Or is that, do you have like, a sta like one that's very, very common that you could give like as a tip to people listening that are playing on the club level? Definitely. I would, I would mainly point out the fact of if the feet are not in the right position, then it's much harder to actually make a play on the ball. I think yeah, the positioning of where you stand in the court and, and how you actually move your feet, it, it, it just depends on, let's say, if you're playing outdoors and it's a bit windy and you don't adjust your feet correctly, then you're never going to make a clean contact with the ball. So it all starts with the feet. And uh, as I always state, um, tennis is played from the ground up. It's uh, through the kinetic chain and making sure that you do the fundamentals right in, talk, in order to get to the ball, you need to move with your feet. <laughs> you can't just rely on just purely great hand skills and good coordination. A lot of what I see is um, you have a racket in your hand, so everyone wants to start with that and use that, which is, which is fine if you're stationary and the ball's coming towards you. But tennis is a highly complex sport and there's a lot of different moving body parts. So in order to be balanced, in order to set your feet correctly, you have to do a lot of things before you actually hit the ball. So uh, I'm a big believer in just making sure that you get just those fundamentals correct. And then when you have set yourself ready, then you can strike through the ball a lot easier. Partly you've done some modeling. Um, is that something you want to keep doing? Uh, and how, what's your experience in general of working with different companies? Because it obviously comes with a different type of challenge, you know, working with different brands. That's right. So in terms of, I'll talk about sports modeling first um, and then brand collaborations later. So sports modeling, something I've been doing for about four or five years now. Uh, I have an agency in London and they would send me on jobs um, all around the world, working with some of the biggest brands such as On Running and Adidas, Gymshark, uh, Dyson. So, I mean, I think it's definitely given me good confidence and uh, networking opportunities have been incredible. So working with some incredible photographers and um, just putting myself uh, outside of my comfort zone a lot. That's I'm a big believer in just 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 putting yourself out there and just doing. <laughs> I, I think that was kind of my my thought process when wanting to play professional tennis. Likewise, in the sports modeling, I think um, working with a brand like On Running was a very, very cool experience. Um, we did big jobs here in, in England as well as Tenerife and even uh, went to Bulgaria as well for a campaign, which the pictures and videos have been shown globally around the world for their new on running shoes like uh, the Cloud Monster, for example. So, yeah, working with different brands like that, it gave me uh, a lot of good confidence in, 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 in basically myself, meeting other people as well. Like I said, the networking opportunities. And it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun as well, getting to, to travel and uh, work with many different brands. But I think, um, yeah, I'll see how long I can do that for, to be honest. I think it could be an age thing, could be a looks thing, maybe. So time will tell on that part. But in terms of the brand collaborations for social media, uh, it's definitely been picking up in recent years. Um, and uh, that's, that's something I would like to uh, work towards even more. I think what I would, what my goal is, is to work with brands that uh, would, I would resonate with. So likewise with shoes, for example, um, I've stuck with one brand, Asics, for many, many years, and they're my favorite shoe. So in order to work with a brand like that is, is an amazing thing for me. And uh, you know, I'm very grateful for opportunities like that. And I think um, if, if you really... Um, follow a brand and you uh, and you like their products, I think actually working with them as well um, helps you to really um, get the name out there for these types of brands. And I've been collaborating with many other brands as well. I'm going to do some racket reviews on, on, on various other rackets that I've never even tried before and not really heard much about. So I've seen, I've seen you've been doing a few with uh, the new Yonex rackets as well. Those are very nice, I must say. Um, I've yet to try Yonex. When I'm doing the sports modeling, that is 
strictly just using your image and uh, your athletic ability. So I've done a lot of running jobs and tennis jobs. So they're purely picking you on just looks and abilities. Whereas for the brand deals and collaborations, that's more so on the fact of um, your skill set, your personality. So I do enjoy the brand collaborations a lot more because you can add your personal touch. Uh, I went to a few um, events around Wimbledon and I got to add my own my own little uh, twist to a few different jobs and, and meeting amazing people and them getting to know me, um, the person behind the camera. So it's not just tennis with Dylan, it's actually uh, everything about me, basically. So I find I find that is is a nice little touch in comparison to the sports modeling world which can be a little superficial i must say because it's it's just okay we booked you for this job um uh can you do this running type style or technique for us and, and these are the exact pictures that we want to get so yeah that's it just promote their product or their release of whatever they're doing so i think i think it's given me a lot of good opportunities opened a lot of new doors and uh it's been uh pretty cool experience for myself i think i've been yeah been pretty grateful for the job that i've had and very fortunate to go to quite a, a lot of amazing events i mean um collaborated with the brand uh Mopi and zag and we went to the img house with ashley the tennis mentor and we got to meet i mean some of the best pros in the world you could ever imagine so actually speaking to um someone like alcaraz he's very humble and He's like a kid, honestly. He's he's such a nice guy. You're shaking hands with him, just having a joke and a chat, and he's playing spike ball. He's a formidable player, and I think uh, he's uh, destined for very big things on 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 tour. I think uh, the only other guys that I would say right now that would match him is potentially like a Yannick Sinner or a Holgeruna. I think I think those two are pretty young and uh, feisty tennis players. Um, I am excited to see what the future holds, but uh, I think I think it's it's very exciting for sure. You told me you're great. Your strengths are movement, and you're interested in that because you wanted to go into strength and conditioning. And I think you know the movement of you mentioned Rune before. That's pretty impressive to say the least. But Alcaraz is even even more crazy because he's so explosive in the way he prepares and the way he lunges himself into the ball. And I think it's just a sign of where tennis is going. Uh, do you think there is an issue with tennis being more and more explosive that more injuries will come? Like that they they will be injured earlier in their career, for example, than if you go 10, 15 years back? Uh, yeah, without a doubt. I, I think if, um, the over, overload of, of tournaments and uh, the scheduling is not adequate, then I think players could get injured quite frequently. I think... Um, with the, with the physicality of matches as well, seeing them going three hours, four hours, even even longer. I mean, it's it just puts a, a big toll on your body. I think uh, while you're young <laughs> and you've got fresh legs, uh, you can you can tough it out for a good uh, five years, but then closer towards 30 and 30 plus, I think your body will start to give in in, in certain aspects. What's been your, your kind of like, schedule and you know you're quite into your you know physical health obviously uh, how much do you work out in a week besides your tennis coaching so currently i have two strength days and those two strength days would consist of one um, push and one pull day so i would train about an hour or so in the gym i like lifting weights um, they're not always the most beneficial for tennis players but uh, for me, I enjoy I enjoy lifting weights. I like the feeling of it. It really like strengthening my body. And and when I see the weights increase, I know that definitely I'm I'm getting stronger. That's that's my way of thinking of it. But one thing that I've uh, I'm a big big believer in is the mobility and stretching. And that has been an absolute game changer for me. Um, I did have a back spasm not that long ago, maybe three months ago now, and that was very debilitating. I I wasn't able to move for days. And uh, it was just due to muscle stiffness, just the muscles being um, overused. Tennis uh, is a very repetition sport. So uh, I think it was me serving. I, in, in one week, I must have hit thousands of serves, honestly. I was uh, training a player, preparing them for tournaments, and I would go through baskets and baskets of serves. Today I talked to uh, a guy, uh, Intuitive Tennis, Nikola, who's a great, uh, great dude, and, uh, you know, we 
We discussed oh, yes, like yes. you know YouTube stuff, how it is dealing with content, content creation, and and he's very good at following data and metrics and stuff like that. Is that something you do as well? Like you're keeping your eyes on on like engagement figures and like new followers. And I I feel like sometimes I get if I get too bogged down into that, like I get demotivated and I stop producing stuff that I like to produce, for example. Yeah, I probably would say I don't actually look too much into the the metrics. I mean, sometimes if brands want to see, okay, what percent of your followers are from the United Kingdom, let's say around Wimbledon time, then I will check through. But usually if they're, uh, if I'm checking through a little bit of engagement, definitely YouTube's, I think, a bigger one for that engagement factor, especially when growing or making more engaging videos. I think, I think definitely I should pursue that even more. But uh, no, I'm not too, not too, uh, yeah, put down on, on the uh, follow account or anything like that. I'm not trying to grow to be the biggest. I just want to share the best content basically to to the to the wider audience. Yeah, I think that's, sure. that's pretty healthy. You seem like pretty healthy and and a smart guy. Um, how important have your parents been in your <laughs> your upbringing? <laughs> Seems like a logical uh, question. Massively. <laughs> I mean, massively. My my mom is a big tennis fan. She's played from a very young age and. Uh, Fortunate to take her actually to a few tennis events. I took her to Wimbledon to showcase center court and things like that. I said, Mom, sorry I couldn't play here myself, but uh, here's another trip. <laughs> I'll take you here instead. <laughs> but um, yeah, my mom has been a huge driving force in, in my tennis and uh, I'm truly, truly blessed that she could uh, help me along my tennis route. And same with uh, my supportive father as well. Both my parents are chartered accountants, so they're not the, the typical. Um, uh, athletic background of people. I mean, my dad played a bit of rugby um, for his school and things like that in New Zealand, but otherwise, for sure, they've been so supportive and uh, you know, truly grateful that they've literally let, let me live my passion and uh, turn it into my, my job. So couldn't be here today without <laughs> without their huge support. Do you have any, so, you have a, yeah. a brother at least. What, what What's your uh, family set up? Do you have other tennis players yes. in your family? Yes, yeah, so younger brother, he's a tennis coach as well. Um, he uh, he played to a decent level as a junior, but uh, not not being quite as passionate as myself. <laughs> but uh, I have his younger sister as well, and she played tennis to a decent level as a junior, but she was more into the art side and, and being creative. So that's something that she was more passionate about. She's at a, the University of Arts London, so she's doing illustration and like a graphic design degree. My brother is pretty creative as well. He uh, has his own clothing line, and uh, he's uh, much more into other things like skateboarding and and uh, kickboxing and Muay Thai and things like that. So we all come from very different creative backgrounds. And I think uh, for my own self, I I knew from a very early stage that I couldn't do like a a nine to five job. I can I can't sit still. <laughs> I'm very active. So tennis coaching and uh, and uh, I like, yeah, I like being in front of the camera as well. And uh, I thought this is a pretty nice avenue to be in. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good, I mean, realizing it early, I think is important. Like what kind of thing do I like? Because when I, you know, when you're in school, you don't have any idea, like for a lot of the time, most, most people don't have any idea. If you go to like, okay, I'm a promising tennis player and you grow up that that's an you know, an option, but then you obviously you need a backup option and not everyone wants to be a coach and you seem to have a very strong passion for coaching. Do you know where that comes from? The, that passion of like, you know, helping people? Is that something you, you feel like from your parents or just a way of upbringing or maybe going even further back in your family tree or you just always felt that way that you want to be like, you know, you want to see other people grow? Uh, yeah, definitely. So <laughs> quite interestingly, oh, well, interestingly, I mean, my I have a very big family. My father's one of six and my mom's one of 10. So they're very much, uh, we're all very family orientated. And um, they used to have their own uh, little Chinese food shops. So they're always big advocates of helping and uh, giving back uh, to other people. And um, I thought uh, for me to make a change in this world, um, even though it's through sport, I felt like what I can offer and the knowledge that I've gained over many, many years, I can, I can give to people, even if, even if it's, it's nothing to do with the money. Of course, it's, it's literally just uh, my expertise in the tennis field. Now I think has gone to a decent level where I can give back and 
I don't need much in return because I think helping other people is something I'm a big believer in. And I think that more people should be like that in, in, in this world. I think there's a lot of uh, hardship in this world. So I think uh, just uh, helping out people in other avenues, uh, playing a sport that I love and, and sharing that is, is something I'm a big believer in. Yeah, I think like, you know, feeling that you can make a contribution somewhere, I think it's very important. I think that's that gives you some purpose because a lot of people might, you know, mm -hmm. be chasing money. Money gives you no actual purpose. You can use it to do things, but you, you don't have like a strong purpose due to money. So I think that is a, it's a very sensible approach. And I think it would be better if that's more of a thing that is maybe taught or maybe, you know, given through schools and education systems that it's like, okay, this is how can you contribute? It's not about like your career for your own sake. It's how you actually mm -hmm. contribute then you can obviously, you will get advantages in life or enjoy life maybe more if you're successful in your field or whatever, but you can also be, you know, whatever. So it's just like, I think the the, the gratitude and the, the feeling you get through helping people is, is very important. And I think it could be, could be used more. Uh, when you are um, coaching people, do you, do you feel their gratitude? Is that something you see like when they are figuring something out or or is it still like sour faces or, or how is that experience for you when you're working with, with players of all levels? Yeah, so I find I find that some people are very responsive and and they take on board everything and and will, they will go through the process very willingly. Whereas you may get some kids that um, um, they just want to be a bit cheeky and 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 uh, try to do other things that they may enjoy. Let's say so, the maybe the technical side they may not enjoy so much. They want to play games or joke around with friends. So I think it's about finding the balance, I think, <laughs> especially when you're working with the younger kids. But even with the adults, let's say, you want to make sure that at the end of the day, they enjoy the sport. That's why they're playing. They're playing because they, they want to have fun. They want to learn a new skill. And that's what you've got to go back to. So if you're, if you're going too much in depth about, okay, this is the technicalities of exactly how to hit the forehand to the tee, and then everyone's going to be like, oh, um, this is this is just getting a bit boring now. I just want to hit a ball, and so you just have to find the balance between that. And uh, I think over time of, of of coaching over quite a few years now, I've I've gained that experience to to find that nice little nice little median. Do you feel like it's? I I notice in my um, you know small coaching experience that it's hard to know how much to pack in, and you you overload people with information. You you see like okay, there's 15 things wrong here, <laughs> so. <laughs> And so, and you see like, okay, the footwork could be better, or you could use your non-dominant arm better, or you could, then it's very hard for me without like any formal coaching training to know what to focus on. Um, do you feel that instinctively yeah. or had that like, it's helped you through your education to understand like, what do I need to impact here? You know, mainly where do I start and how do I disseminate this into a, a piece of useful information for the player? I think uh, what I would start from is how do players learn? So you can learn through feel, the kinesthetic. You can learn through visual. You can learn through me talking. I think uh, you're trying to find the balance between the different ones. I think I think a lot more people uh, are more active. They want to actually physically do something. And so if you talk them through it and they, they can actually feel uh, like what their arm is doing or where their leg is stepping, that helps them to learn a lot more. And I find that um, over time that when people go through the repetition of practicing certain shots or moving in a certain way, then they kind of grasp it themselves. And, and I like not overloading people with information. I like giving them like small snippets. And I, I really like it when I just ask them a question. So like, um, how did that feel? And so they give me their feedback and they can compute in their own brain maybe what they need to work on rather than me always overloading them and being like okay make sure you have a chopper grip make sure that your racket's in this position elbow da, da, da. and then they're, they're going to just be like okay i don't even remember the first step <laughs> so yeah i try to give them less is more i believe um small little bite-sized pieces at a time and ask them questions too so they can give me their own uh, feedback as well what's the kind of stroke you see people struggle the most with is it like a one-handed backhand or is the i mean the service and, and never-ending problem for oh, everyone the right? serve the serve for sure there's so many ways to coach the serve and it's so complex <laughs> i find uh yeah people always come to ask about the serve and uh and and i think to break down the serve it's it's very complex i think 
most people uh, will not quite see the full um, service motion uh, through their, let's say, playing days. You need to you need to basically dissect it into certain um, areas. And one of the most notable coaches I've been following is Dr. Mark Kovacs, and he's got a, a, amazing videos on on the serve. They call him like the serve doctor, <laughs> and uh, he helps to break it down a lot as well. And I find that if I'm going to give players um, uh, tips and stuff for their serve. I also give them exercises as well. I'm a big believer in just doing. They just need to um, go through the exercises and practice it themselves rather than me just, yeah, like I said, just talking through. Um, other shots, I mean, I've always had a double-handed backhand. That's my favorite shot. But uh, I do think the single-handed backhand is a, is a pretty tricky shot as well, especially when getting pushed back on high deep balls like... Uh, can't imagine playing on the clay with a single-handed backhand. That would be a, a, a pretty tricky one <laughs> as well. Yeah, we actually had that conversation about that. I, I talked to Grisha from Gladiators uh, YouTube channel the other day, and and he um, pretty bluntly said that he thinks the one-handed backhand is almost like going extinct at, at some point, you know, soon, because when mm -hmm. you're dealing with a guy like, for example, Alcaraz, or, you know, before it was Nadal, who was just pinpointing your one-hander and... Oh murdering it with high loopy balls where you can't really generate oh, yeah. any power right do you do you agree with this statement or you think there's there's hope for it on the pro level uh, i mean i was a uh, i mean i'm not the tallest guy but um in terms of unless if you have the stature and physicality for it it's it's very hard to deal with those types of balls i think someone like dan evans has done amazingly well um He's, he's, he's pretty unique, though, in, in the skill set that he has. His incredible slice backhand and uh, maneuverability on those higher balls as well. So I think there are there are very uh, very good players. Uh, I mean, Tissi Pass and Stan Bavrenka, to name a few, that have quality backhands, even, even Gasquet. But I, I'm a big believer in the, the double-handed backhand. Yeah, it will stay, will stay true. <laughs> I see a bit more on the WTA Tour that players have... Uh, two hands on both sides as well and um, I'd love to know your your views on that because I feel like some players even volleying with two hands and, and they're pretty solid at the net but uh, I guess the maneuverability and stuff like that may not be as as quick with the with the one arm but yeah what is your views on the on the on maybe having two hands on both sides interesting yeah, I think I think there's definitely cases where that can apply and I think maybe we will see some evolution of tennis in that sense because I, you know, you sometimes you play with people. Uh, I hit with a guy the other day who's playing with almost like um, he was two-handing the slice, right? Which looks really strange, mm. but <laughs> it was quite tricky too. And he had kind of, may you know, done a good job with it, like for his for his level. I think he, he was a tricky side spin slice to it, and he, he really cut it down because he had help from the other hand as well or the other arm. Um, and you have guys, obviously, Santoro back in the day he was playing double-handed on both sides. Yes. And, yes playing a lot of weird shots and, and stuff that you wouldn't see today. But if yeah, you can... reach, maybe. Yeah, reach is a, is a bit of a problem. But let's say you were playing with a longer racket, 28 inches, for example, and you, you learn how to hit really well from both wings. Because, I mean, now the, with the, when the footwork is so good, uh, the players get to balls much faster. Then that extra stability, especially like I watched some doubles. I was at, in Bostad in the, in the, Nord the Swedish nice. Open, Nordia. And you see the doubles players, and, and I saw these Dutch um, Dutch players who are ranked really high. They they would the amazing touch at the net, like they just put balls away without thinking, even if mm. like straight at them at at the high pace. And a lot of their volleys were actually like double hand volleys, like they just used that for extra really? stability. Yeah, I saw some double handed oh. volleys there. Yeah, I saw some really cool uh, video from uh, Jamie Murray. He he just uh, did a video about just putting your arms there, <laughs> literally just getting your racket to the ball. And just blocking the ball back so that was interesting and i also saw a video on functional tennis uh i think the boy's name is teo he has two hand two forehands he has uh one hand lefty one hand righty and i was like i have never seen this before this is very unique so yeah you're right maybe we could see some a crop of of uh unique players coming through maybe they could change the game but uh yeah, let's let's see. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that would be interesting if you see more and more changes. How is tennis doing in? Let's if we look at your part of London, do you still see a strong interest? It, does it get like you know competition from, for example, paddle over there, or or do you feel like you know tennis is still doing really well in the UK, for example? I think certain areas. I think it's um, to be honest, it is. 
I mean, there are parks and stuff where you can play tennis, but due to the weather and and, and our conditions over here, um, you need an indoor facility. I mean, it's, it, it would be very, very difficult to play uh, at a high level uh, throughout the whole year if you're only playing outdoors. I mean, you're subject to getting your balls absolutely soaked, slippery courts, injuries, things like that. I think it's it's quite difficult. So I think if you were to have an uh, indoor facility accessible, then definitely that can help you. I don't think uh, paddle is going to quite take over here. Neither has pickleball. Uh, that's not even come over yet. So I, well, I haven't seen anyone playing that. So I think uh, these other sports, not quite yet. Maybe maybe due to the history of tennis here in uh, in England, it's, 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 it's pretty high. So not quite yet. <laughs> no, no, also it's, it's kind of um, confidence inspiring that you see as a tennis fan. You, like Wimbledon seem to have really high attendance figures this year, and I, and then the tournaments I've gone to seems to have been quite popular, even for like because usually ATP two fifties you go early days, it's a little bit dead, you know. There it's not that oh. packed on the on the uh, on the stands, but it looked like Wimbledon, for example, this year when you have the big big events like the Slams, seems to have a very good attendance. You know, did you you went there one day? Or, yes, yeah. yes, I went there two days actually. The first day was with a brand, and the I went the second week. On the Thursday, actually, um, with with my family, just for a day out, and uh, we got to see a lot of the juniors. So I got to see some of the top British girls playing, um, and a few of the boys as well. Which is uh, I even saw Henry Henry Searle actually, who won the boys singles, which was very cool. But I I thought, yeah, why why um, people that maybe are not even the biggest tennis fans actually want to come to Wimbledon just for the aspects of um, just to watch some tennis, have a nice day out. It's uh, it's beautiful there. I mean, the amount of flowers and, and the greenery there as well. So it's an overall nice day out. And so even if you're the biggest tennis advocate, I mean, it's just a, an overall nice day out. Yeah, I know, I know exactly. So you do, can just enjoy it and have a have a pims or a drink and, and, and yeah, eat a yes. cake. I know you're a big fan of sweets or, or generally for, for a sporty guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do have a bit of a sweet tooth. Yeah, which is... That's right. But you don't drink alcohol, so that's that's kind of compensation. No, no, yeah, true, yeah, no, no, I can't, I can't drink that. Yeah, that's actually good. But otherwise, how 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 well do you follow like your diet theory? Like you know, thinking about your diet, what you eat, you know, how stuff like that for your tennis, for example. Yeah, no, I'm um, I eat pretty clean, to be honest. Um, yeah, I love my Chinese food and things like that. Um, I, I I don't have a particular diet tree thing where I, I stay away from certain foods and such um i feel like i do need to eat more though <laughs> being on court and the physicality is required i mean even coaching even if you're doing an, a seven plus hour day you burn a lot of calories so i think uh yeah i've probably lost a little bit of weight so i need to need to pack on with a little bit more food intake i also think that having um some shakes and things like that alongside my training I know uh, some people use Huel, um, and they and they say that's uh, like a, a meal replacement on the go kind of thing. So I've not really tapped into that kind of avenue that much yet, but um, I think I need to look for other things that can help me while I'm on the court. And I think the same for when players are competing and playing in matches. I see like Novak eats dates and stuff like that on the court. Some people um, have fizzy drinks and things like that, a little bit of sugar spikes, but... I think, uh, yeah, I just need a bit more fuel <laughs> to get me through the, my day. Yeah, because I mean, you're that's a long work day, and even if you're not always hitting balls, you're feeding balls. Sometimes you're you're devising exercises, you're moving and you're standing. You're never pretty much sitting down for long stretches, right? So obviously, having some kind of like just meal replacement, just to add extra calories to your day, so you get some energy, uh, but also making sure you're staying, you know. It's easy to get injured as a coach as well. People don't realize, like, because you're always there, you're always moving, your your body does get a bit tired, and then you maybe, if you do a lunge for a ball, you're maybe a little yeah. bit more susceptible to some kind of injury uh, as well, right? And also, your, your, I guess your, you know, your elbow just being used a lot if you're hitting a lot, that, for example, is something you have to watch. Definitely. Up. Yeah, that's that's um, when I take care of my recovery. That's something I've worked on a lot in, in years. Um making sure that you stretch a lot, you massage, foam roll, things like that. Making sure even warming up. I mean, doing small things before your training sessions or even coaching and then at the end of the day as well, 
it's it's like the little things uh, to keep your body ticking. I find that if you if you are not to do something for let's say periods of time, then you feel you feel the difference for sure. Like uh, if I'm if I've had a busy week, let's say at Wimbledon, that week I wasn't able to stretch much. Uh, I wasn't able to have a good adequate sleep, so my body was feeling fatigued and uh, definitely definitely felt it after after that period. Yeah, yeah. No, so you need to obviously take care of yourself. We talked before we started recording that about like you have some more traveling plans or you want to go traveling. Uh, do you have something to share there or like some thoughts you have that you need to be more active in in going to certain events or just being out there on the tennis scene kind of? Yeah, definitely. I would I would love to to visit academies in Spain. Um I think I think uh, a lot of what they're doing is uh, a lot of incredible things uh, with a lot of their juniors and, and pros. I mean, I think I'll I'll stick to Europe for for the time being, but uh, America would be a, a great a great part there. I have a lot of good friends there since I studied there as well. I think that would be a nice step to take, and then maybe even going further out to Asia as well. I think um, trying to meet coaches academies uh, and uh, individuals from different avenues and just get them to share well basically i'll share their stories and uh, learn different coaching methodologies and uh, meet young juniors or, or current budding pros as well I, I think that actually seeking those people to actually meet them and talk to them i think i'll get a, a great idea for what um, they may d be doing in order maybe to be successful in certain avenues so if I can acquire knowledge and 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 things from people globally, I think that will really help to elevate my own coaching. And uh, yeah, I think I I would love that uh, opportunity as well to to network with more people. Yeah, it's always good. It's something I enjoy a lot when I'm traveling, like that I meet just people from all aspects of life, not only tennis but but other things as well. Uh, you get contacts, you have you meet friends, and it's a great way to be uh, out and about. I think also when you know, you had COVID for two to three years. It's it's also extra nice to <laughs> feel like you're able yes. to travel. Um, and that was yeah, yeah, it was tough for tennis players. You, <laughs> that period. Yeah, are you are you traveling anywhere? I, in, I've I've been like now months then, or do you, have you planned some more events? I want to. I wanted to go to the U.S. Open, but usually um, I can get some kind of press accreditation. But I was I was too late. I I wasn't thinking that it, you needed to be fourth five months ahead. So now I'm, I don't. Maybe I can oh, sort out some okay. other way of going there, but it would be not, super nice to go there. Um, you know, went to Paris, which which we did together as well, and went there with Adidas as well, and um, nice. yes, and yes. a few events like Mallorca and Stuttgart, for example, the ATPs, and now the one in Sweden as well. So I've been to a few ATP events. It, it's quite Great. you know energy consuming at times um, because you you you're actually working all the time and you're meeting tennis people. I'm sure when you go to Wimbledon, you have people coming up to you like hey, you're Dylan, you know, and then you want to. <laughs> talk to you for example yeah, yeah. yeah a few people <laughs> yeah but, you... uh, no i think it's good it's good to go to the tournaments and actually uh see the action live i think i would love to do that more too uh, for sure and yes to come out do that yeah i think it's it's good it's it's um you s partly you get like always it's always fun to watch live tennis but it's also the people you connect with there and you get a little bit more behind the scenes of how much work are going into you know a coaching team or how the players prepare. If you're, you know, lucky enough to have some access or be close to them, you're, you're seeing like how they work, and you, you obviously you can watch the practices, which I think is one of the most underrated things to see in a tennis tournament. Mm -hmm. Is that you can actually be close to see how they practice and what they do to prepare for a match. It's obviously not the same practice as they do maybe in, during off season or a week off here and there. But most players seem to go and and travel every week, you know. And I, sometimes I wonder. Yeah how that life is when you have to go and you, you play one match, you lose, and then the next day you're on a flight to another tournament and then you oh, play in qualities wow. or whatever, you know? Yeah, no, that's incredible. I mean, the fast-paced life of a, a tennis professional, It's uh, there's a lot of highs and lows. I mean, it's really, really rocky. And the small glimpse of what I experienced, it's, it's for sure very, very tough, uh, mentally, physically, everything. So I think actually seeing... The players in action i mean we can appreciate the the what the, what they do and the, and the level that they can perform at week in week out yeah for sure uh, having a chinese background now it seems like china is doing pretty well now in tennis like they're i mean in, in the oh yeah in the, among the latest they've always been pretty good or at least the last like 20 years or whatever but now you also have like male players doing really well 
Uh, do you think mm-hmm. that, I mean, it, that must obviously lead to some kind of growth for tennis, also in other parts of, of the world, not only like Europe and US, which has been kind of this the tradition? Definitely. I think uh, I have a few contacts um, in China, actually. So I think that could be a cool avenue to experience. I think I'm I'm British born, uh, lived here basically my whole life. So I think actually venturing over there might be a very unique experience for the or what tennis would may may be like over there, I, I don't know yet. So I think it might be something I should touch upon. But I think, yeah, I, de- I definitely think a lot of the Chinese players are definitely taking over right now. And uh, I think we will see a lot more of them in, in, in many years to come. I think what we've seen so far is probably a glimpse of maybe the future talent that could arise. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the same with, I mean, we have so many large countries that I think if they see any success, obviously that becomes like a, a inspiration for other generations. Then suddenly you're going to see a spike somewhere where, where players popping out. In Sweden, we have a low period of tennis because uh, we had like our spike in the 80s. And now it's <laughs> like you're seeing tennis half struggle a bit, not as a sport overall, but as like a, a way of getting getting ATP pros and, and WTA pros. There are a few, but it's not quite that common. But in some countries, mm-hmm. maybe also in Middle East now with like Ons Jabor, for example, doing so well, mm-hmm. she inspires yes. a lot of like Middle Eastern people that are not maybe traditionally a tennis culture uh, to go back and to go and play tennis and, and to uh, to become tennis pros. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think that's uh, it's amazing to see people from different uh, different backgrounds and things like that. And, and countries maybe you may not think that they have a big sporting prowess tennis background and uh Hopefully we can see more of that. I think that's very exciting. It just brings in another dimension. You see, you see in Spain. I mean, I can't remember the statistic, but uh, the amount of Spanish tennis players that were in the top 100 was was scary. <laughs> I mean, there was at one point it must have been yeah, like probably like 40 people or something like that, or something crazy. I mean, I'm not sure exactly, but yeah, I think they were doing a lot of things right, and and maybe other countries have copied that, <laughs> but. Yeah. Also, I think the federations of different countries, you, I want to I get to understand and, and meet some of the higher up people in, in various countries to understand what they are doing differently to other countries and, and seeing how that can make a difference on the growth of their young uh, juniors and feeding into the pros like uh, Canadian tennis as well. How that was booming and, and still is. I mean, you're seeing a lot of young young juniors from there were have, have arisen now to being top 100 players too. Yeah, and then having that extra, like that extra kind of a star of some kind. Like I don't know if it started with Mils Raunic or, uh, but now you have Chapo, you have uh, Aliasim, you have yeah, Bianca Fiendish, Andreescu, yeah. you have quite a lot, lot of players from there. And then, then obviously mm-hmm. that, that becomes like a snowball in motion. So it's then you start having more and more players from from under as well. I think we've seen that in, in Italy, for example. We had Berrettini, we have Musetti. Oh, yes, yes. But there's now Arnaldi and, and uh, you know, so many good players, Cobolli coming up. Very exciting. Very exciting. I cannot wait to see. I mean, that's that's the great thing about it. When when maybe uh, some some players do very well in, in, from a country that's maybe needing that little boost, I think uh, then the rest of the country rallies behind them and... Uh, and puts more funding into into the sport. So, yeah, can't wait. What do you think of uh, British tennis? Do you see any... Um, now we have some maybe promising stars. Do you think British tennis are in for a world, at least a top 10 player in near future? Um, yeah, I believe so. I believe so. I think um, I've been around a lot of the young juniors and even watching some of them at, let's say, Junior Wimbledon, for example, some of the girls. And uh, they're very promising. They're only 14 years old, even... 14, 15 years old, but you can already tell like the qualities that they have. I mean, there's a girl, Isabel Lacey. She was already beating top 100 players. I think she's about 16 years old, possibly. Oh. Hannah Klugerman, 14 years old, made um, her and Isabel Lacey were runners up at Junior Wimbledon. So, I mean, those are two to name a few that are already uh, making big waves, I guess, in the tennis world. And I think... Um, Likewise, I think boys as well. Uh, British tennis is in a good place. And I think, uh, yeah, definitely piecing together a lot more things now. I think uh, personally, I've, uh, I've always played in the LTA. I didn't actually play through the different stages of the balls. But I think that was a great progression for someone even like uh, Emma Raducanu. Um, 
there was you may have seen that video Emirat Khan and Sunny Cartel uh, they were playing an orange ball at nine years old on a three-quarter size court and you can already see like the athleticism the movement the the quality of striking the technique everything was there but it was just on a smaller size court so I think the British tennis are doing very well at that because it's just a smaller glimpse of what it would be like on a bigger stage and they're just going through the progressions a lot uh, smoother as opposed to just rushing and jumping into okay let's go big court straight away let's go big size racket uh, let's go uh, heavy loopy balls straight away and I mean if you if you go through the natural progressions of the, these various different balls it actually really helps the juniors to progress uh, correctly and uh, reduce or mitigate any chances of injuries as well yeah I think that's a good point I think the 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 nature of tennis is quite taxing so if you can find a way to smooth that curve while your body is growing and changing I think it makes a lot of sense uh, but some yeah some uh, sometimes you see that they want to just you know snowball straight I, I mean I when I used to live in Malta people used to come young very you know promising players used to be like hey 13 12 and they you know been playing a long time with a pure drive strung at 28 kilos and you're like okay <laughs> and the elbow issues came for example in that sense like because it's like they're playing heavy Definitely. balls oh overplaying and with a very stiff setup right so it's it's yeah and and, and your grip as well i think that's a, what i've seen a lot i mean spanish players notably i mean not so much French I've seen, but German, yeah. I mean, the grip, yeah, slides around further. I mean, when the ball's rising above your head and you're only yay tall, I mean, how can you deal with that? You got Your grip just slides around naturally. So I think, yeah, going through the right progressions will definitely, will definitely help, for sure. Do you work, um, you have a mix of, of the students, or you, do you have certain players you work with like every week a number of times, but you, you'd have kids groups, or do you have like only private lessons when you coach? Yeah, so, um, well, at uh, the club that I'm at, David Lloyd's, we're committed to doing eight hours towards the club every single week. Um, we do work 50 weeks of the year, actually, so it's a, it's a heavy schedule. So I'm committed to do those eight hours towards the club uh, in order to be able to coach and do individual lessons and such. But you do get paid for groups as well. I would say, though, yeah, I have a balance. I have tots, so three years old, four years old, five-year-olds, <laughs> and then I have... Uh, the women's team training as well every Monday. So I have 12 ladies that I would run different training sessions. So yeah, I have a real balance um, of, of, of ages and abilities. And I think that's fun. That's what keeps me uh, energized and uh, keeps me on my toes, definitely. I mean, uh, one hour you're working with um, uh, the ladies team, teaching them how to do intercepting volleys. And then next you're teaching kids how to catch a ball. <laughs> it's very it's very different <laughs> so it's it's a lot of good fun and uh something i i enjoy a lot too when you were played on uh, i mean you played d1 college what, well, how was that experience to, to play i mean some players love college some thought it was too much tennis i have friends that quit tennis due to college but mainly i hear positive things what's what's been your experience with the college or in the us i think it's incredible i think if i were to um send kids to to either go pro or college, I think, unless if you're at a, that high of a level in order to, to let's say, make it as a professional, I think still the college route is nece necessary. I think uh, America definitely have uh, have it very set in stone. I mean, we've seen the likes of, let's say, like the Chris Eubanks as one of the most recent guys and Ben Shelton. These guys have absolutely dominated uh, the tennis world right now. And they've all come from college tennis, I think. You learn to be more professional. You learn to grow up and you have friends with you as well. I think there's nothing that beats that college tennis spirit and actually getting a degree alongside as well. So you have a backup. I mean, um, I mean, you, you never know what can happen in life financially, um, health wise. So I think having the security of having a degree as well alongside your tennis, you, you will have a backup, no doubt. And uh, that's where I see college tennis in America as being one of the front runners that I would uh, advocate for. And same with British tennis. I played British tennis in in UK um, in the top division. And then you're getting AX ATP professionals playing. They've come to do their masters, uh, a guy from New Zealand, and he's X400 in the world. So <laughs> you get a real mix of players and abilities. But I think America has just done that even bit better there. And uh, 
I mean, you're even able to get paid now when you go and play futures tournaments so you can actually make money and play pro. And then if you're good enough to play pro, you can then leave uh, America to uh, to literally pursue being professional. So I think that it's a win-win, honestly, even if I've seen players like Cameron Norrie uh, doing a few years uh, at TCU and then wanting to go pro because he has the level. He's number one college in America and he has that experience of playing matches week in, week out, having a strict training schedule and having someone to always have an eye on you, basically. Yeah. And also, I think sometimes, I think when you take off the pressure of like, I have to succeed at this thing because this is my my passion, my only job really that I foresee. Uh, and if you take that away and you say, okay, I, I mean, you know, I have the backup on the education. I can go and have a normal job or I can become a tennis coach you maybe feel a little bit more um, less pressured and you play better. Yeah. I, I've seen that at least with in other sports as well, where you feel like you have you have that backup, that foundation of something else. You feel more secure in yourself. You don't have to put everything on the court and then you have an injury and it's like a horrible thing. You know, your whole life falls apart. Definitely. I think also playing professional tennis, It's you can't play professional tennis. Well, not everyone can play professional tennis for 20 years or so. I mean... I don't know, do you know the life, uh, well, the span of uh, what a pro would play at on average? It's probably not... Not that long. I don't think it's not more than 10 years, no doubt, right? So think about how much money you can make from playing professional tennis. I mean, if you're top 200, 150 in the world, let's say, I mean, there's probably better facts out there, but... Yeah, if, if you want to pursue something else long term, at least, yeah, you have the security. That's the biggest thing, I think. And like you said, in the back of your mind, um, Jonas, you, you have that in mind that even if I don't make it as a top professional or even if I play pro for X amount of years, I can fall back on other avenues and, and, and not be too worried about that happening for sure. Yeah, I think it's it's good to always think about life like that, that you have a little bit of a, of a backup. I mean, some players maybe feel better when they just go all in and, and they have to do it and mm-hmm. no, yeah. no, um, there's no distraction. Like, I mean, some people are, are easily distracted or feel like they don't put in everything uh, to their training schedule or whatever. But I think uh, I think it's generally a wise idea. And you have seen so many pros from U.S. college, for example, they, they succeed. And and then, uh, you know, then they also have the backup. So it's a win, win-win, as you said, right? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And that's, I think, yeah, like I said, if I were to get anyone uh, that's at a good standard, I would probably push them down the route of go to university, but play college tennis. And uh, then we can really see your level from there. And that'd be a good uh, good standpoint. Yeah. And so uh, how's your, what's your day, normal day looking like? Do you start really early? And do you finish so, late? What's, how does it uh, look? Um. Summertime, it varies, but usually, uh, yeah, weekends are very busy. Uh, I usually do 10 hours on Saturday, 10 hours on Sunday, uh, 8 to 6. Um, I have usually about a 20-minute gap in between to post my video. Wow. Eat some food. <laughs> um, yeah, usually client from 8 a.m. groups till 12, and then, um, yeah, usually from 12 to 6 or 11 on Sunday to 6. So heavy weekend of work. And Monday's another heavy day. And then Tuesday to th- Thursday, it really varies. I mean, sometimes I might do four hours in a day. Sometimes I might do eight hours in a day. Uh, Friday, I've made my day off. And uh, Wednesday afternoons vary. Sometimes I just film some videos, like YouTube videos now, or I edit. So my Wednesday afternoons are a bit more flexible as well. But uh, yeah, no, I love I love being <laughs> close to the tennis court, let's say. <laughs> And you're pretty close. You're like ten minutes because we, of our technical issues we had today. <laughs> you, you could drive home, and you were yeah, yeah. You were yeah, suddenly there. Was back home. That's right. That's right. So it's very handy. And uh, yeah, no, no, I know. I'll probably always live pretty close to a tennis court. <laughs> I think that's that's a thing you, you cannot underestimate to have easy access to tennis courts. Like I think that's any, anywhere in the world. Like if you want people to actually play tennis, you need to have accessible courts uh, to actually mm-hmm. just even just see tennis you know people play tennis look that looks fun maybe we should try and then you even as a, like a small kid i think that makes a lot of sense to have tennis visible and we've lost some of that in sweden because i some of the public courts you know they're not used anymore they're like they're decrepit or there's something has happened to them 
uh, while I think you have a bit more public courts maybe in the UK, but then you have the weather against you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, true. That's right. I mean, our courts are like tarmac or astro. Yeah. So not natural tennis courts, but I mean, yeah, I mean, we, I have a park down the road where I first started. It's literally five minute walk. So a lot of parks close by with 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 accessible tennis courts. So, yeah, it's uh, definitely flourishing here over here for sure. Yeah, that's good. That's very good. When it comes to, I have to ask you the question about rackets and stuff, because that's uh, some of the listeners definitely want me to do that. Uh, so what do you, yes, I think sure. you play with a pure drive, am I correct? That's right. Uh, 300 grams, uh, 1619 string pattern. And I'm currently using, I think you tried it as well. We spoke about the uh, caviar strings. Yeah, yeah I really like line. that one. It's very, quite soft, but so, it's still uh, spinny friendly, right? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're very durable as well, I, I found. And yeah, I mean, you can't beat that <laughs> bright, bright uh, fluorescent yellow color as well. So uh, no big fan of the pure drives. Um, but yeah, I'm going through a lot of trialing and testing right now. I've, uh, I've tried the, um, uh, the Wilson blades. I mean, I have the pro staffs as well, Artengo. I have a few rackets from them that might be coming out in the next few weeks. And then um, Wilson shift. So I think well, yeah, well, actually, I did try a Technofiber racket as well. So I think I'm I'm willing to trial a lot more rackets. I'm not, since I'm not playing professional or anything like that. So I think it's interesting to experience different rackets. I think I I haven't done that so much in the past. I've usually just stuck with one. But uh, yeah, maybe if I did try a different racket, it could be a little bit different. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I know. So you, you you get different sensations. So it's depending on what what you like, you know. And obviously, coming from the pure drive, you want power and some spin for your game to feel at home. Uh, but what's your experience, for example, trying a low powered racket like a pro stuff or a blade? Do you feel like completely off your game, or like that it feels unnatural to you, or or how does that feel? I think when I when I swing at full speeds, uh, I get great control, and I feel a lot more comfortable when serving and and playing the field shots, the volleys, the slices and, and drop shots. But I find it quite difficult when I'm at the baseline, just striking and trading. I find that I need to put a lot more weight into my shots. I think I, I did use, um, what is the head, head prestige? I used to use that actually, because my, my coach used to use that. And I said, oh, since he's using it, I'm going to try it. And I think I was 13 years old and I was like, oh, this is, this feels tough to play with. So I probably, I prefer definitely like a, a, the bigger sweet spot rackets, a bit more power. I used to use the Babylon Aero. I would love to try the uh, Carlos, um, the Aero uh, 98. Um, have you tried that before? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a very good racket. I think like a lot of advanced players who played pro that I've I've uh, hung out with or we hit uh, here in Spain. When I bring out like a bunch of rackets from different brands, that's one of the winners. Like they just like that mix. Really. Of, because for the head size, it gives you impressive power, you know, and the spin is, is very good, right? So you, you think that it's mm -hmm. 98, 16, 20, you think, okay, it's going to be very controlled, but it's far more powerful than a blade, for example, or a head radical or something like that. So you do get quite I a see. lot of, of pace, but you feel a bit more, if you play with enough spin, you feel like you can definitely control the ball a bit better. So I think there's a reason why it's nice. so popular, right? And also, Alcaraz is using it, Holgaruna, um, and is Felix using it as well? He's using an older uh, version, which is a little bit different, but it's yeah, it's very similar. Uh, Arthur Fields, okay. for example, I think is using it as well. The, the new talented Frenchman who yes, yes, who, oh yeah, yeah. He beat Rude okay. the other day, like big, big time. He beat him bad. <laughs> yeah. He beat him bad. Yeah, he's playing uh, Zerf now, I believe. Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, no, it's 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 obviously a very popular racket. I would love to try that too, but no, good to hear your thoughts about it as well. Do you watch a lot of tennis? Like, do you keep up with the matches? Because, I mean, if you're on the court for so many hours, it's going to be, like, draining to go home and be like, oh, I don't want to watch any tennis today. I'm, like, sick of it. I love, uh, <laughs> I love watching highlights and things like that. I watch a lot of them on tennis TV. Uh, TV. I watch, uh, yeah, I like to stay up to date with the players as well. And, and I feel that's uh, quite nice to see. I saw Kaini Shikori, actually. He, he, he lost. Um, but, uh, no, he's making a comeback as well. So it's so nice to, to see so many... Uh, of the ex pros that were like top ten before, and now they've come back, and and we still have Murray playing as well. So, you know, I try to stay up to date. I, I'd say though, I don't watch that much tennis. Uh, yeah, due due to the schedule and things like that. But for sure, yeah, I'd like to visit more tournaments. Maybe we'll meet up again in a, in a in another tournament. I'm sure. Yeah, we will. 
I'm, I'm sure we will. I think tennis is such a good um, networking point. I think like tennis players are generally easygoing and, and pretty, you know, easy to get to know people, you know. So I think that's that's been a good thing for me to go from more kind of working in business uh, centered things and then going to tennis where it's more of a community, mm -hmm. I feel like. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's very sociable as well. And you meet some people from very cool different backgrounds as well in, in the tennis world. Yeah, yeah, everybody seems to, and it's also like it's one of those sports where, you know, when the passion hits you, it hits you quite hard. So you find you find a lot of people that are quite new to tennis, maybe, that just like they can't stop thinking about tennis. It's all tennis, 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 tennis. It doesn't matter if they're CEO of a big company or whatever. You know, you can. They just like seem to be when they're not working or with their family, or whatever. They're like, oh, tennis is tennis. <laughs> So, oh, but, I've met many, many, many people like that, actually. Yeah, <laughs> the tennis bug. <laughs> yeah, the tennis bug hits you. It, it hits you quite hard, which, which I think is, is fun. So it's a sport that definitely has huge potential to capture people. Uh, sometimes I find like that uh, it's so difficult to learn. And uh, maybe you did something you've noticed as well. Like if, if you, when you're coaching, let's say not complete beginners, but whether they're, they're quite new to tennis, um, do you have any tips and tricks? Like, how do you get over that hump that they can actually start maybe having more fun with tennis? Because the fun starts when you start rallying properly, right? Uh, one guy had the idea of, of having weaker players or, or intermediates, lower level intermediate players play with, for example, green balls, like the green dot balls. Just to make would, sure. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. Even, even uh, orange balls or have you tried playing like, uh, you know, when people play touch tennis, yeah. sponge balls as well? I mean, yeah, if you play with uh, softer balls, it just gives people more time. Yep. I mean, let's say the ball bounce is 25% slower. You're able to adequately put your feet in the right place, stick your racket out and swing. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, having a lot of different uh, peers as well to play with makes it a lot more fun. I think if you're going solo to various different groups and you're like, oh, I'm not good enough to play with this person, then... It's kind of like you don't have anyone to bounce off ideas or or you're going through the emotions of this is this is very difficult like you're you're with a group of people so we have a nice balance at my club for sure with that and to make to make it more welcoming yeah that's nice it should be like that it should be like that because it can be daunting to play tennis with uh, if you're a new new person and you you're in a group where you're playing mixed in doubles and then you have to you let down your partner and you feel like oh you know i'm playing terrible and you don't want to be through that because tennis can be quite embarrassing you're like alone on a big court and it's like people maybe watching or walking by it's a lot of people can struggle with, i think that experience you know yeah no, no it can it can be but i think i think it's nice you got to make it as welcoming as possible and then as fun as possible that is uh, that's great i actually have a dinner i need to go to now <laughs> so um... yeah, no worries no worries no no it's been it's been really nice speaking to you jonas and i'm sure we'll catch up very soon too. Yeah, we should. We should uh, for yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, keep in touch. I keep in touch with Ashley as well. Uh, you know, we yes for the listeners, really? we we all met in, in in Paris, and it's fun when you've seen people like fellow content creators on social media, and then you actually meet them in in real life, and they're nice people. It's always a, a good good experience, and then you can keep in touch. Yeah, and, we yeah <laughs> yeah we had a fun we had a fun evening, didn't we? <laughs> Yeah, it was nice interesting time. for sure. You 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 play with uh, one of the biggest Chinese stars on a concrete court, so it was a bit different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a good laugh, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah. it's always interesting with these events. You never know what you're gonna get until you get there. So it's that's the fun part. You're like, yeah. okay, what's happening here? I have no idea. You just invite it, and then you see what happens. You know. That's right. That's right. Yeah, on the spot. On the spot. No, but have a have a lovely dinner, and uh, Jonas, it's been great speaking to you. Same to you. Have a nice day. Definitely. You too, mate.